Greetings, and welcome to the Boston Beer Company first quarter 2024 earnings call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A brief question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If anyone should require operator assistance during the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Mike Andrews, Associate General Counsel and Corporate Secretary. Thank you, Mike. You may begin. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome. This is Mike Andrews, Associate General Counsel and Corporate Secretary of the Boston Beer Company. I'm pleased to kick off our 2024 first quarter earnings call. Joining the call from Boston Beer are Jim Cook, Founder and Chairman, Michael Spillane, our CEO, and Diego Reynoso, our CFO. Before we discuss our business, I'll start with our disclaimer. As we state in our earnings release, some of the information we discuss and that may come up on this call reflects the company's or management's expectations or predictions of the future. Such predictions are forward-looking statements. It's important to note that the company's actual results could differ materially from those projected in these forward-looking statements. Additional information concerning factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from those in the forward-looking statements is contained in the company's most recent 10Q and 10K. The company does not undertake to publicly update forward-looking statements, whether as a result of new information, future events, or otherwise. I will now pass it over to Jim for some introductory comments. Thanks, Mike. I'll begin my remarks this afternoon with a few introductory comments and then hand over to Michael, who will provide an overview of our business. Michael will then turn the call over to Diego, who will focus on the financial details of our first quarter results, as well as our outlook for the remainder of 2024. Immediately following Diego's comments, we will open the line for questions. We were pleased to see flat depletions in the first quarter and to deliver revenue growth. Twisted Tea continues its strong momentum, and we continue to make steady progress on our margin enhancement initiatives. Our strategy to return to long-term sustainable growth through investing in our powerful brands and continuing to innovate in Beyond Beer remains unchanged. The cash-generative nature of our business and our strong balance sheet supported our repurchase of $65 million in stock thus far in 2024. I'd like to thank our Boston Beer Company team, distributors, and retailers for their support in a solid start to the year. And I'm delighted to have on the call today Michael Spillane, who formally joined as our CEO earlier this month. Michael's strong operational experience in consumer products and his long history with our company make him the ideal choice to continue the implementation of our strategy to return to long-term growth. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Dave Berwick for his 19 years of excellent contributions to Boston Beer and his assistance to Michael in the transition. I will now pass the call over to Michael. Thanks, Jim, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to join Boston Beer's president and CEO after serving as a board member for eight years. I spent my first few weeks meeting with our team, our distributors, and visiting the breweries, which has reinforced my conviction and the opportunities that lie ahead for the company. Boston Beer has powerful brand equities, the best sales force in beer, and a strong team with a unique entrepreneurial culture. The cash generation of this business is powerful and allows us the optionality to invest in our brands and long-term innovation. We remain focused on implementing our strategy to deliver long-term sustainable growth and improve our operational efficiency while being disciplined stewards of capital. Our highest priority of a com- as a company is to return to delivering sustainable volume growth. This involves protecting and nurturing our core brands so that they may reach their full potential while continuing to drive innovation in Beyond Beer, which we expect to drive category growth. <clears throat> in our core brands, we're highly focused on providing the appropriate levels of marketing spend on both working media to drive awareness and attract two new customers, as well as in-store at the point of sale to drive conversion. Working with our distributors and retailers, we'll continue to focus on maintaining strong service levels and ensuring we re- recapture and recapture the share of shelf that our core brands deserve. Finally, we'll continue to innovate on our core brands and we'll be fine-tuning our product roadmap to manage innovation and line extensions in a disciplined area. 
Within our core brands, Twisted Tea's momentum continues with dollar sales up 21% in the first quarter while growing share by 1.4 points in measured channels. We continue to increase distribution while maintaining strong sales per point and achieved additional space in the spring shelf resets. Twisted Tea is the original hard tea brand with strong brand awareness and loyalty, and we intend to invest appropriately to maintain the number one share position with strong growth. Twisted Tea Light continues to be highly incremental, and we're encouraged by the early results in test markets of our higher ABV Twisted Tea Extreme. We remain focused on stabilizing truly and have seen sequential improvement in our lighter flavor variety packs and single serve packages. However, the hard seltzer category remains under pressure in 2024, and we continue to expect category volume declines in the low teens. Truly is now a smaller part of our business mix given Twisted strong growth, but remains a 20% share of hard seltzer in measured channels, and we're working, on, we're working diligently to improve its trajectory. Across our other core brands, Sam Adams, Angry Orchard, and Dogfish Head, we see areas of opportunity and remain focused on nurturing these brands, which remain an important part of our portfolio and the company's craft legacy. We introduced the new Sam Adams packaging late in the first quarter and will continue to invest in Boston Lager, seasonals, and new innovation as well as our non-alc offerings. Sam Adams non-alcoholic grew 52% in dollars in the first quarter in Menthe Channels. In addition to supporting our core brands, we'll continue to focus on long-term product innovation to plant seeds for future growth. Our goal is to generate st a steady cadence of brand innovations, which will test in smaller markets to determine the winners and move forward to national launches. Our 2024 innovations in the early stages of rollout will have more significant impact in the second half of the year. Sun Cruiser, a vodka-based tea, is in its early stages of on-shelf availability and thus far has been well-received by distributors and retailers. Hard Mountain Dew has begun to transition to our network and positions us well to expand the reach and consumption of hard dew as we eventually will achieve national distribution. Today we are reiterating our 2024 volume guidance of down low single, digit, single digits or up low single digits. While the first quarter is a solid start to the year, it's a smaller quarter and our key selling season remains ahead of us. In my first few months at the company, I will continue to focus on further refining our product roadmap and innovation process. I believe we have the right teams, infrastructure, and strategies in place to return to long-term volume growth. I'm excited to work with the team, our distributors, and retailers to deliver on our objectives and look forward to meeting investors and analysts in the month ahead. I'll now pass the call over to Diego to review our first quarter results and 2024 guidance. Thank you, Michael. Good afternoon, everyone. Completions in the first quarter were flat, and shipments increased 0.9% from the prior year, primarily due to the growth in Twisted Tea, offset by declines in Truly Hot Seltzer and our other brands. Shipments were higher than depletions, as distributors built inventories to support our peak selling season, and we shipped some additional product to support the implementation of our new automated customer ordering and inventory management system. We believe this system, along with other improvements in our supply chain process will help us further reduce waste and optimize our network. We believe distributor inventories as of March 30, 2024, was at an appropriate level for each of our brands and averaged approximately four and a half weeks on hand compared to four weeks on hand at the end of the fourth quarter of 2023 and mirroring the four and a half weeks at the end of the first quarter of 2023. Revenue for the quarter increased 3.9%, Due to volume increases, pricing, and lower returns, our underlying pricing for the first quarter was consistent with our full-year guidance range, with additional benefits from the lower returns. Please note that we do not expect the benefits from the returns in the first quarter to continue in the balance of the year. Our first quarter gross margin of 43.7% increased 570 basis points year-over-year year on a reported basis. Gross margin was up 360 basis points year over year, excluding one time in the prior year quarter related to the Truly Vodka Seltzer rebrand and the non-recurrent payment to a third-party contract brewer. The underlying gross margin expansion in the quarter was primarily related to pricing, 
including a benefit from lower returns, procurement savings, and improved brewery performance on higher volumes, which were somewhat offset by inflationary costs. Excluding shortfall fees and third-party production prepayments, which we've discussed in prior calls, our gross margin was 44.9%. Advertising, promotional, and selling expenses for the first quarter of 2024 decreased $5.2 million, or 4.1%, from the first quarter of 2023 due to lower freight costs as a result of both lower rates and efficiencies. Within brand investment, we increased our media spend which was more than offset by declines in other promotional spending. General administrative expenses increased $6.7 million, or 15.3% year over year, primarily due to higher salaries and benefits costs, which includes chief executive officer transition costs that were fully expensed in the first quarter, partially offset by decreased consulting costs. We reported EPS of $1.04 per diluted share, compared to a net loss of $0.73 per diluted share in the first quarter of 2023. The year-over-year improvement was driven by higher revenue and higher gross margins. Our tax rate of 33.0% in the first quarter was higher than our plan rate, which was driven by non-deductible compensation expense related to the CEO transition costs. Now I'll discuss our 2024 guidance. Our fiscal week depletion trends for the first 16 weeks of 2024 have decreased 2% from 2023. We are reiterating our 2024 volume and EPS guidance from our February call and updating our full year tax guidance to 28.5% due to an increase in estimated non-deductible compensation expenses related to our CEO transition costs. We continue to expect 2024 depletions and shipments to range between a decrease of low single digits to an increase of low single digits. We expect price increases between 1% and 2%. Full year 2024 reported gross margins are expected to be between 43 and 45%. We expect commodity inflation in 2024, but at a lower rate than 2023, primarily driven by sweeteners and flavorings. We continue to expect to cover commodity inflation dollars with pricing, but do expect some additional margin headwinds from higher labor costs in our breweries. Where we land within the range of our guidance will be somewhat dependent on the mix of products sold. The contractual shortfall fees and production prepayments amortizations that we've discussed in our last call are expected to have a lower negative impact on full year 2024 reducing from 175 to 225 basis points to 135 to 185 due to changes in the timing of our production prepayment amortization. As these contractual terms expire, we will reassess our capacity needs and commitments with our third-party production partners. Our investments in advertising, promotional, and selling expenses are expected to range from a decrease of $5 million to an increase of $15 million. This does not include any changes in freight costs for the shipments of our products to our distributors. We are currently targeting full year 2024 earnings per diluted share of between $7 and $11. This projection is highly sensitive to changes in volume projections, mix of own versus partner brands, supply chain performance, and inflationary impacts on consumer spending. As you model out the year, please keep in mind that our revenue performance is impacted by seasonal volume changes and timing of shipments. During the first quarter, shipment trends were above depletion trends and we're currently estimated that they will rebalance, resulting in shipment trends being lower than depletion trends in the second quarter. Also, please note that the fourth quarter is typically our lowest absolute growth margin of the year. Turning to capital allocation. We ended the quarter with a cash balance of $205.4 million and an unused credit line of $150 million, which provides us with the flexibility to continue to invest in our base business, fund future growth initiatives, and return cash to our shareholders through our share buyback program. For the full year 2024, we expect capital expenditures of between $90 million and $110 million. These investments will be primarily related to our own breweries to build capabilities and improve efficiencies. 
during the 13-week period ending March 30, 2024, and the period from April 1, 2024, through April 19, 2024, we repurchased shares in the amount of $50 million and $15 million. As of April 19, 2024, we had approximately $200 million remaining on the $1.2 billion share repurchase authorization. This concludes our prepared remarks. And now we will open the line for questions. We will now be conducting a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate that your line is in the queue. You may press star 2 to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. One moment while we poll for questions. And our first question comes from the line of Rob Ottenstein with Evercore ISI. Please proceed with your question. Great. Thank you very much, and, and congratulations, Mike. Um, a, a, a few questions. One, can you give us um, any sense of, of what, what was going on in April? Is this just kind of timing with Easter and, and um, you know, kind of best to look at uh, all 16 weeks together in terms of giving a fair picture of, uh, of current trends? Uh, so, so that would be number one. Um, number two, can you talk about truly shelf space gains uh, in – um, in 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 the spring shelf sets for the core products. So I think I know I know a lot of the some of the flavor and the innovations uh, lost some shelf space, I believe. But did you actually gain any shelf space for the core business? Uh, and why not leave it there? Thank you. Perfect. Um, I, I'll, I'll take um, so I'll, I'll take the first one. Um, so if if you or, or do you want to take the the, the truly one first and then we go through. Uh, well, I'll take the first one then. Uh, I'll, I'll take the first one, which is we look at uh, at least kind of 16 weeks, 13 weeks period, because to your point, there's year-on-year comparisons. Uh, Easter moved. Uh, there's specific uh, ordering patterns from distributors that move from year-on-year. So if you take one week or four weeks, you can always have the comparisons. for. So for our point of view, we always take 13-week comparisons and up to look at the trends of our brands. Right, and then in terms of the the truly shelf space, um, it continues to be a, a very fluid situation where um, we're we're moving to some of the lighter flavors. We also have um, this year truly and really uh, rolling out as um, as a as a new addition to the line. So again, I think we'll look for um, continued um, adjustments where we will be losing some shelf space with the the. Flu- the flavors that aren't tracking and um, adding in some of the lighter flavors. Thank you. And the next question comes from the line of Steve Powers with Deutsche Bank. Please proceed with your question. Uh, Great. Thank you. And uh, congratulations, Michael, as well for me. Uh, Two questions I could, uh, one for for you and then one for uh, for Diego. Firstly, for Michael, just I, I guess if you could, I'd love for for you to expand a bit on any new priorities um, that you see for the organization, any points of emphasis that you have, either strategically or operationally, um, as you as you approach the role. Uh, I'd love that. And then Diego, um, you know, the the start to the year, at least from I think from an outside perspective, was a lot stronger than expected on gross margin. I'm curious how it compares to your own <clears throat> expectations coming into the quarter, and if it um, now makes you more comfortable um, you know, with the upper end of the gross margin range for the year, or if it's too premature to, to make that call. Thank you. Okay. So I appreciate the congratulations. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'd, I'd start off by saying, you know, I've, I've been on the board for eight years, so I, I was very familiar with the team and the strategy, and um, I'm, I'm really impressed by both. Um, where I think I'm, I'm leaning in is just making sure that we're truly um, ep- executing to that strategy and making sure that we have end-to-end alignment. <clears throat> we're truly, we're really focused on growth um, and getting back to that long-term um, sustainable growth. 
uh, and, and probably trying to get a little bit sharper on our innovation, making sure that it's distinctive, uh, it's profitable, and it's scalable. So, um, again, but I want to emphasize we have a fantastic team in place and uh, walked into a really good plan that we're just going to drill down to and make sure that we execute at a really high level. Perfect. Steve, in, in your gross margin question, what I would say is we're still very confident with our gross margin plan, um, and, and that's why we're maintaining our guidance. Similar to, to the question around year-on-year -year comparisons, the gross margin has year-on-year -year ups and downs when you compare, but overall we think we have a strong plan, uh, and we are maintaining our guidance to arrive at high 40s to 50s in the next three years. So I think this is just one more positive step down the line of that plan. And the next question comes from the line of Bonnie Herzog from Goldman Sachs. Please proceed with your question. All right, thank you, and congratulations for me too, Michael. Um, I have a question on your advertising, which was down in the quarter. What do you believe is the right level of advertising spend, I guess, as a percentage of sales moving forward? I'm trying to understand, I guess, on some level, why you maybe don't see a need to increase spending as competition intensifies, you know, in hard C, <clears throat> and then in an attempt to return truly and, and maybe, quite frankly, some of your other brands to growth. Your thoughts there would be helpful. Great, and thanks, Bonnie. Um, you know, we're always looking at um, opportunities to invest where we see good returns. And again, a lot of this could be timing. Um, to the extent where we have upside in our performance this year, we'll, we may choose to invest back in. Um, we're continuing, again, to, to, to look where we can drive sustainable uh, growth. Um, look for Twisted T. We continue to invest in the strong investment there, and we assess the rest of the portfolio as it as we'll see fit. But um, we're aligned that uh, where we see upside in the, in the performance, we will probably choose to reinvest in marketing. Okay. And Bonnie, um, as a general, general rule of thumb for us, um, you know, we are – a growth company, that's a very important objective. And so we will tend to, as a rule of thumb, um, have a higher share of voice via our advertising than our share market. Because um, in the long haul, that generates you know, share gain, and we're in growing categories. Okay. So you guys feel good about the spending levels, trying to kind of maintain the momentum behind Twisted and then reaccelerate some growth or, or stabilize, I should say, truly. Okay. Yes, I if, think that's a fair statement. Okay, that's helpful. And then if I could just ask another question on Hard Mountain Dew. I'd love to hear a little bit more color on the performance for the brand in, in the quarter and, you know, again, maybe whether it's lived up to your expectations and Ultimately, you know, what are your ambitions for the brand this year, especially in light of, you know, the comments you made earlier about your expectations for the hard seltzer category to decline in the low teens? And then could you guys confirm whether, you know, hard Mountain Dew is in your guidance or not? Thank you. So, perfect. So, I'll, I'll take that. Uh, I think the first one is a lot of the performance is in in areas that we have not rolled over the brand. So as we've mentioned before, it's it's going to be a long a longer transition of the different states and the different pieces to move over from Blue Cloud to our distribution network. So we do expect to have uh, some ups and downs along the way, but in the long term we feel it's a strong brand that has really good equity and I think bringing it into our distribution networks uh, will be really strong. Uh, it is within our guidance uh, as given our current role plan, but there could be some upside or some adjustments if we are able to move some of the uh, territories faster that we currently have planned. All right, thank you again. And the next question comes from the line of Eric Serrata with Morgan Stanley. Please proceed with your question. Great, thanks so much. 
Um, hoping you could give us your perspective in terms of the recent slowdown in twisted T and track channels. Obviously, mid-high teens growth is still very impressive, but a big slowdown from where you were not long ago. Um, how do you sort of unpack that slowdown between your know, kind of interaction with other brands, um, just sort of tougher comps, larger base? Um, and then how do you, how, uh, Mike, do you look at the opportunity uh, or runway from Twisted from here? I know uh, your predecessor used to use the analogy of uh, physical and mental availability. Um, how do you, wh what lens do you look at it through and uh, where do you see the runway? Thank you. Um, in, in terms of the, the, um, the sort of, uh, recent trends. Um, it's a very short period of time and we're, we're, we'll continue to assess it. Um, we wouldn't say that it's anything we're going to, um, we're, we're, we're paying attention, but we don't see it right now as a, um, a longer term uh, trend for, for, for the business. Um, as noted, we will be investing at the appropriate levels for Twisted Tea in terms of marketing. Um, we have a Twisted Tea light that is coming in that is uh, where we're, we're capturing uh, an, an additional customer. It's not um, in any way cannibalizing our existing uh, customer. And we also have um, the extreme product, which is a higher um, uh, content that we feel very optimistic about. So um, I, I just believe that we're, we're, we're going to be able to maintain that. It's a, it's a high priority for the company uh, and the consumer is um, – very much committed to the product. We also have a, an opportunity to, to bring new consumers into the brand, both Hispanic uh, and, and African-American consumers, which we are reaching out to. Great. Thanks so much. I'll pass it on. And the next question comes from the line of Nadine Sarwat with Bernstein. Please proceed with your question. Hi, thank you. Evening, everybody. Um, two questions for me. First, a question for Michael. You know, Boston Beer has obviously had, as uh, as you know, many successful waves of innovation in the past year across multiple categories over the last couple of years. So, as you come into this role, I would love to hear how you view the future of Boston Beer's portfolio, taking a long-term view, perhaps over the next three five years. And how do you see the mix between that the new to world innovation versus line extensions? Um, and then a second question, obviously some very nice gross margin performance this quarter. Could you give us an update on the level of your capacity utilization, both for your internal production and your third party contracted capacity? Thank you. Great. So I'll, I'll take the first part of that. And um, I see us doing, you know, driving as we have in the past, um, a, a balanced portfolio. And so we have our great brands, which, um, you know, the way I like to put it is we need them all to reach their potential. I see a lot of opportunity in, in um, both beer, dogfish, um, angry orchard, um, we look to stabilize truly and get back to growth there and then continue to drive twisted tea. Um, the exciting thing for me and, and one of the key reasons why I, I signed on for this role is because we're a great innovation company. And so um, we have some, some great products coming through the pipe now, including Sun Cruiser, which is a vodka-based hard tea, uh, which has been well-received uh, in the marketplace. Um, but our ability to re repeat that formula for success. So innovation will always be part of who we are. Um, as, as you know, you know the, the Beyond Beer category is growing uh, at a, a better rate than beer. Um, we like to think we're the best people in that space. So we'll continue to feed that and, and drive that part of our business. Uh, it's really important for us. So a balance between doing core and innovation um, to be honest, sometimes we, we, we maybe chose to do one or the other, and we're going to find the balance to, to make sure that we um, have both uh, pillars uh, reaching their potential. On, on the second part of your question, I'll, I'll confirm to you the exact numbers, but we've been moving from an 85-15 <laughs> uh, 
a mix to a 90-10, where we, we really want to be 90% of the production in-house, and uh, especially leverage external for uh, high-complexity uh, products. So, But we'll come back and confirm the Q1 number, per se. Thank you. And the next question comes from the line of Filippo Falorni with City. Please proceed with your question. Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and Michael, congrats on the new role. Um, so I have uh, two questions. One on, on Twisted Tea. Um, it, clearly, you've done very well over the last couple of years, including last year with significant distribution and shelf space gains. Maybe you can give us a, some level of context on these current spring shelf space resets and how much are you expecting to gain incrementally for Twisted Tea. And then my second question is a follow-up on gross margins. Um, Diego, I think you mentioned Q4 is the lowest gross margin um, of the year, but typically your gross margin is higher uh, sequentially in Q2 and Q3. Should we expect a similar sequential improvement in gross margin in the next two quarters, or is there something in particular that we should think about uh, from a gross margin cadence? Thank you. Okay, so I'll, I'll jump on the first part of that, and then I'll pass to Diego. So, again, just reiterating on Twist to T, you know, we're, we're the market leader. We're continuing to expand our space. We're continuing to add brand support and making sure we're spending uh, both on sponsorships and, and uh, marketing to, to drive demand. Um, we're bringing in new drinkers, which is really, um, you know, how, how this is going to continue to grow. And then we're bringing in energy. So, for instance, the um, – the, the Rocket Pop party pack will, will be dropping now, which was a, a big driver of business last year. Um, and again, I mentioned Twisted T Extreme, which is the higher ALK, which will um, we think is going to energize a, a new consumer force. So we'll, cons we'll, we'll consistently feed that business with new energy, and we see opportunities to expand our, our, um, our shelf space. Uh, on your gross margin question, uh, yes, we will see a higher gross margin in, in Q2 and Q3. Uh, we also did mention that we had a really strong production and shipment quarter in, in, in Q1. <clears throat> so a little bit of that will come out of Q2. So the, the jump between Q1 and Q2 might not be as high as we've seen in other years. But we're maintaining a four-year guidance because we still believe that we have a really strong gross margin uh, roadmap. Great, thank you. And the next question comes from the line of Michael Lavery with Piper Sandler. Please proceed with your question. Thank you. Good evening, and uh, congrats, Michael, as well. Um, just two, if I can, a follow-up on Hard Mountain Dew and, and the distributor transition. I know you said it takes some time. Are there likely to be gaps in existing uh, distribution markets because of the transition as it gets handed off from one to the other, or is that more seamless? Maybe just help us understand the mechanics a little bit, if you can. And then um, on uh, so, some of the new innovation, was pipeline fill a, a big factor in the quarter, or, or is it just more some ordinary trade loading and deloading that you're calling out as the, the one and two Q dynamics there? So I'll start with the second part of the question. Yes, um, exactly. It's just the normal um, flow of the business and sort of timing. And, and I will also add, as we talked to before, we, we've implemented a new uh, uh, material sourcing and, and uh, inventory management system with our distributors. So we loaded up a little bit uh, before we put it in place just in Q1, just to make sure that we uh, that we were able to correctly uh, source and supply all our customers. So it's not a huge piece, but it's a little bit of what I discussed. Yep. And then in terms of Mountain Dew, um, we feel like the transition is tracking, but um, again, I would I would say it's a little bit fluid. Um, and, uh, you know, we're hoping within a reasonable time that we'll, we'll have national distribution. Okay, great. Thanks so much. <laughs> As a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate that your line is in the queue. You may press star 2 if you'd like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. 
one moment while we poll for additional questions. And the next question comes from the line of Bill Kirk with Roth Capital Partners. Please proceed with your question. Um, thank you guys for taking the question. Um, I have a follow-up on, on one of Nadine's from earlier. Um, I think it looks like in the, in the 10Q that in-house production number uh, was 79%. And I guess the question is, uh, one, I, that's the highest it's been in years. So I guess the question is, seasonally, when we get to those bigger production months in the summer, what can that number look like? You know, it's 79 in one Q. What, what can it look like in the heavier summer months? So, so again, I, as I mentioned, when we when we talk about where we would want to be, we want to be at 9010. We know we know right now we're between 80 and 85, to your point, 79 specifically in the quarter. But uh, we'd like to get to 9010, and that's our plan. But it also depends on the mix of products that's flowing through our facilities. Uh, there are some specific products that we only have externally. So that is one of the key drivers of where we end up. But that, that's, our, uh, that's our target to get to those levels as we go forward. Okay. And then on the shortfall fees, it looks like you got a payment from the third party, like a, a prepayment back from the third party in 1Q. Is, is that related to the loan you get to kind of start the year? And are there any other mechanisms like that to, to reduce shortfall fees by a, extending them some money up front? Like, uh, in, in the form of another loan. So, can you just repeat that question for a second, please? Yeah. So, on the cash flows, uh, it looks like there's a almost three million inbound from third-party production prepayments, like a positive cash flow from that relationship. And I was just wondering if it had anything to do with that, uh, the money you lent them, where I think the uh, the, the the payback is a reduction in prepayment. Uh, so I guess I guess it's two questions. What is that positive number uh, on the on the cash flow? And are there mechanisms to lower your prepayment obligations by ex extending them credit? So so the, the, there's there's two things at work here. There's the pre there, there's the 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 timing of the amortization of the payment that has nothing to do with the loan. So that's one. Uh, so, and because we, we, we expanded part of our terms, we've, we've changed the amortization of our, our payments. The second one is we've made a loan uh, to Citi. That loan will be repaid and some of, and the amount it will be repaid at will have some similarities to the fees that, we, the, the fees that we would have been paying, but they're independent. They just happen to be uh, similar uh, amounts as it's as the as the repayments schedule has been agreed. Does that make sense? It, it does. And are there, are there any other ways like like that loan to to do something similar to reduce prepayment uh, in the future? Well, it's not technically reducing the prepayment the the the, the shortfall fees because the reality is. We've loaned them. We're getting the money back. That's that's an independent piece of the shortfall fees. It just happened to be the mechanism while we get it back. But in the future, what we're doing is, as our contracts come to an end, we are reviewing what footprint we want going forward based on our strategies, and based on that, we will negotiate with our third parties to see what the right level should be. Okay. Thank you. And I might add um, the. Uh, the the ninety ten balance of internal external is a is a longer term goal. Um, we're we don't have the capacity to get there this year, um, and and our uh, you know for the foreseeable future, uh, city brewing is our, our our pretty much exclusive contract uh, partner, and you know, they they are a key piece going forward. So it's going to be a while. Before we get to ninety ten, it's not this year, probably not next year, but longer term, we could certainly see that. Ladies and gentlemen, there are no further questions at this time. I would like to turn the floor back over to Jim for any closing comments. Well, thanks to everybody for joining us and for giving Michael a warm welcome and uh and I'll, I'll recognize, you know, Dave Berwick's contribution um, uh, this quarter because most of it was 
under his guidance and direction. So I've been very fortunate to have two amazing people help lead this company. Thank you. And this concludes today's teleconference. You may disconnect your lines at this time. Thank you for your participation.